more emotional question. My colleagues and dear students, today I'm going to talk a little about uh, the fictional town of Malgudi and its colonial roots. However, this write-up that I'm going to read cannot be called a paper because it's uh, it, it, it's very hurriedly written uh, for this event only. So it can be considered like a draft of uh, an initial draft uh, of my argument. R.K. Narayan is unquestionably one of the most well-known Indian authors writing in English. He is one of those lucid, discerning storytellers whose stories inevitably make their way to Indian school textbooks. Any academic course in Indian literature in English is particularly unimaginable without at least one of his novels. Moreover, with the Hindi version of the screen adaptation of the guide in 1965, attaining a cult stature and also the abiding popularity of the television series Malguri Days in the late 1980s, R.K. Narayan became a familiar name in almost every Indian middle class household of the last century. Besides in comparison with two of his most significant and absolutely brilliant contemporaries, Mulkraj Anand and Raja Rao, whose names are almost always uttered in the same breath with that of his own, Narayan is also the most pleasantly readable. The dignified simplicity of his language, which is generally considered to have an Indian twang to it, the easygoing humorous style of his writing and the graphic depiction of common ordinary characters and their otherwise mundane lives punctuated with sudden puzzling encounters and experiences make him one of the most widely read and beloved English authors of India. Above all, after more than two decades of his death well into this 21st century of glamour and dazzle, he is still fondly remembered by his readers as the creator of Malguri, or more precisely, as the old man of Malguri, the small fictitious town in the southern part of India. Let's just have a look of, a, of an illustration of, an iconic illustration of Malguri. Now, Malguri is basically R.K. Narayan's locus standi. <coughs> R.K. Narayan is surely not the only writer to create a fictional space to accommodate his own creative insights into and representations of human life. In that regard, he is commonly clubbed with writers such as William Faulkner, Thomas Hardy, Arnold Bennett and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. But in spite of this apparent similarity, all these writers are very different from one another in their respective authorial intention behind creating such a space. For example, Marquez utilizes his fictitious setting of Macondo to deploy his own brand of magic realism to address the absurdity of Latin American existence. Whereas Hardy's Wessex novel, steeped in the strong regional flavor, offers a starkly realistic representation of rustic working class life of southwestern England which intrigued the contemporary Victorian readership. Even in the context of Indian literature in English, Narayan's immediate quaver, Raja Rao II, employed this strategic tool of an imaginary setting in Kanthapura. But while Raja Rao's Kanthapura, a fictional village in South India, becomes a transcendental utopian space of solidarity subsumed in Gandhian idealism, R.K. Narayan's Malguri remains embedded in the mundane history and geography of a rather obscure southern region of India from the late colonial era of the 1930s right to the arrival of globalization in the early 1990s. This very historicity of Malguri adds to its dynamism which enables Narayan to locate all but one of his 15 novels and most of his short stories with all their varied appeals in and around Malguri. Malguri 
a semi-urban town in the south of colonial India. Arkinaran's first novel, Swami and Friends, was published in 1935, introducing the readers for the first time to this invented space called Malguri, a small town situated somewhere around the Madras Presidency and the princely state of Mysore in British India. It means that even if we can uh, never vouch for the exact geospatial location of this fictional town on the cartographic image of our country, we can definitely identify the temporal space occupied by Malguri in the colonial history of India. Malguri has no space, but it has time. It is of profound import that among all the graphic depictions of the town, the small station of Malguri would become one of the most iconic illustrations with its unassuming platform by the railway track. The picture that we are looking at right now. For the railways were perhaps the singular predominant pan-Indian trope of British imperialism and colonial modernity. Malguri is, therefore, similar to most of the not-so-old semi-urban towns which got alienated from the vast expanse of the rest of the rural agrarian country by dint of an inherently truncated form of westernization, yet could not transform into fully developed orderly urban spaces because of persistent colonial exploitation. The railway track here signifies this dichotomy of westernization and exploitation connection and alienation. Let me show you another picture. Apart from the railway station, the two other iconic structure of Malguri, namely the Albert Mission College and the statue of Sir Frederick Lolly, are also imposing symbols of the British rule in India. Sir Frederick Lolly, a 19th century British architect who created the town of Malguri by combining a few villages, can easily be seen as a fictional recreation of Arthur Lolly, who was the real governor of, governor of Madras in 1905. We all know that all the major colonial towns of India, Calcutta, Madras, Bombay, and New Delhi, were founded in a similar fashion by early colonial adventurers or architects. In this regard, the origin of Malguri is identical with all, these, all of these cities. The second formidable edifice of Malguri, the Albert Mission College, exemplifies the discursive aspect of the empire. In the Albert Mission School, little children like Swami and others are regularly taught the larger than life achievements of the early colonial explorers and adventurers like Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus, who changed the history of the world. The innate absurdity of this colonial education system is particularly underscored in the tragic tale of Ishwaran. He stoically endured every humiliation for years to pass the intermediate intermediate examination, instead of earning respect from his classmates for his unflinching tenacity, Ishwaran was treated as a sort of thick-skinned idiot. Finally, when he accomplished the impossible task of passing his examination, he perhaps lost the very purpose of his life and in a state of hallucinatory stupor, killed himself by drowning himself in the river Sareju. Now we'll have a Look at the map of Malguri. We do not have Malguri on the map, but that does not mean that Malguri has no bank of its own. 
This old-fashioned pictorial map of Malguri, as it is used to be before the independence, is however also a work of fiction and a cartographical one. It was Dr. James Fennelly of New York uh, Adelphi University who compiled the map as an illustration to a scholarly article written by him entitled The City of Malguri as an Expression of the Ordered Hindu Cosmos. He read the article in the American Academy of Religion in 1978. Whether we agree with his argument as evinced by the title, it goes without saying that the map is an extremely useful guide to the socio-historical scenario of the town. Even Arkinarand himself was impressed with the work to such extent that with the consent of, uh, consent of Fennelly, of course, he published it in the front of his 1981 edition of Malguri Days. Now, if we have a close look at the map, we can see the Albert Mission College. Uh, we can't really see, and I'm sorry that I could not manage to find a better uh, a map with a better resolution. So we have to somehow manage with this. We can see the Albert Mission College, the Ishwara Temple, the Welcome Restaurant, Palace Talkies, the Cinema Hall of the town. If we can imagine ourselves walking west along the Market Road, we will pass by Dr. Pal's Tourist Bureau the local office of the Madras Daily Messenger and then the statue of Sir Frederick Lolly, the former British governor after whom the Lolly Extension Housing Project is named. The river Sariyu flows to the north of the town, somewhat securing the physical margins of the urban space. For near the river, there is a village of the untouchables where Gandhi stayed on a visit to Malguri in 1937. There is also the Sunrise Picture Studios where Mr. Sampath, the printer, made an unfortunate venture into the film industry. At the northern end of the town, beyond the river, rise the Mempi Hills with tigers and forests and hidden temple caves. The map is quite interesting as there is nothing there which is redundant or which does not have a bearing upon the emergence of Malguri as an essentially colonial town. The river Saraju, with a mythical name alluding to the legendary kingdom of Ayodhya, and the exotic and wild Mempi hills are not mere natural embellishments. These are the material exigencies. The very fact that Malguri is located at the bank of a river implies an agricultural past of the region. Maybe there are still farmers tilling their lands at the outskirts, although gradually receding with the advance of the town. In the guide published in 1958, just a decade after the independence, we get a fleeting nostalgic glimpse of how life was simpler for an older generation who lived in a primarily agrarian society infused with traditional culture. Raju's father had a little grocery so shop where farmers on their way home stopped to chat about the weather and crops. Raju also remembers that as a child, he went to sleep every night listening to the folk tales and the stories from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which his mother knew by heart. The Mempi Hills, too, speak of a more ancient, wild and ascetic history of mankind with its tigers and hidden caves. In the time of the stories, however, the hills attract the attention of archaeologists and tourists, generating employment for people like Raju as tourist guides. The hunting, man -eaters, the hunting of man-eaters from the forest also adds to the thrill and adventure of an otherwise humdrum town life. As the map suggests, Malguri is not a static space. It evolves with time following the convoluted course of history, as A. Hariprasanya in The World of Malguri, a study of R. K. Narayan's novels rightly observes, Malguri lives and grows and develops from novel to novel from the early 30s to the early 90s. Now let us talk a little about the people of Malguri. Now R. K. Narayan had probably had a deeper understanding of the impact of British colonial rule in India than he is generally credited for. India's natural and human resources continued to be exploited for the industrial expansion of England and except for some small industries catering to British commerce, India's own industrial growth was somehow stunted. Agriculture, was suffered. Agriculture also suffered with the iron feast of the colonial extortion on the one hand and the burden of the western ethos artificially superimposed on the feudal base of the Indian agrarian society on the other 
resulted in the emergence of the hybrid forms of towns and villages with the inhabitants caught between the contradictory pools of tradition and modernity. Malguri is a typical example of such a hybrid town which carries all the symptoms of an uncalled for surgical transplantation in its body. It has its doctors, lawyers, English teachers, as well as astrologers. In Malguri, there are characters who are rather unconven who, 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 with rather unconventional occupations as well. For example, Raju is a tourist guide who later becomes an event organizer. But the traditional sweet vendors, small shack owners, and even money lenders are also to be found. These people, however, are having a hard time to cope with the changing times. Some of them are even devising ingenious methods to keep their business running. Unlike Rao's Kanthapura, a thoroughly traditional village stratified in terms of caste, Narayan's Malguri, a hybrid town which is apparently drawn by class. This class consciousness is prevalent even among the children of Malguri. In Swami and Friends, Swaminathan, the boy protagonist who never flinches from questioning the absurdities of the adult world, cannot help observing the contrast between the posh locality of Rajan's house and the dingy neighborhood of Kilacheri, where he goes looking for the coachman's son. Nevertheless, Malguri also could not get rid of the evils of traditional caste system, as there are still the untouchables living in the ghetto at the margins of the town. In Malguri, we find neither capitalists nor proletariat. There are no factories, big or small, around Malguri. There are small businessmen, agents, shop owners, insurance and family planning officials, printers, taxidermists, <coughs> archaeologists, circus managers, script writers, actors, and petty filmmakers, along with respectable middle class professionals and white collar job holders. None of these people have any direct contribution or even connection with the agricultural or industrial production of the country. They chiefly belong to what is now called as the service sector. The inhabitants of Malguri are small people of small town, or to quote V.S. Naipal, small men, small schemes, big talk, limited means. They constitute the middle class, or more precisely, the petty bourgeoisie of India. Away from the hegemonic con conflict between the colonial masters and the bourgeois nationalists during the late colonial era, this bigger chunk of the Indian people was busy trying and making its way up the social ladder. These are the people who occupy a grey and somewhat unheroic chapter of Indian history, which could only be redeemed by the unpretentious artistry which is so natural to Narayan. Thank you. Thank you for patiently listening to whatever I have written. Now I would like to uh, invite my colleague, Professor Devotutida, to present his paper on Arkinaran. Thank you. Actually, uh, at first, uh, before beginning my speech, uh, because uh, we have a scarcity and paucity of time, I would like to ask ma Madam to announce uh, the the winners uh, of this uh, poster competition. So, kindly, madam, please, if you could announce, would be our. Hello. It is paintings and sketches related to the life and works of Arkinaran. Uh, there were 12 participants. And I have to announce only three winners. I'm sorry. Uh, third, Vikranta Gupta. Yeah. Thank you. Second, Shayon Mondol. Thank you, Shayon. And first, Deepika Kormokar. Where is she? Yeah, we are missing her. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the uh, announcement.
So, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the uh, third prize which Vikrant uh, uh, got, Vikrant Mukta got, is uh, this one. Uh, the uh, the second prize which uh, Chayon got is this one, and uh, the first prize that Deepika got is this one. We have uh, other uh, brilliant uh, efforts of the student displayed here. Uh, this one is the third. This one is the second. This one is the first. Third man. This one is the second. This one is the first. And uh, so, and. Uh, uh, this uh, this particular uh, painting is also brilliant as well as this one. But the problem is that this one, uh, both of these paintings are not of R.K. Narayan, but of R.K. Lakshman. So we couldn't qualify this one and this one, though they are brilliantly done. This one and this one has been unfortunately uh, not been qualified for that. Uh, though the uh, milieu is there, but um, uh, the person, the central piece is uh, not R.K. Narayan. So we could not. Uh, you know, take this into the competition. Hello. Is, uh, it's a great honor and a privilege uh, to be allowed uh, to come to speak um, for our Kinarayan. And uh, the topic of my paper is Phenomenology of Time in our Kinarayan's Malgudi Days.
ancient myths, legends, customs, and traditions. The result is that the contemporary story in the novel acquires the quality of a perennial fable and also the apparently incongruous blend of realistic and the fable. This is where the apodicity of the present is held. More importantly, Narayan's protagonists are deeply affected by the experiences they have undergone in the process. And uh, as uh, I can quote from T.S. Eliot's one of the famous remarks, for order to persist after supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever, so slightly altered. To meet the needs and the brevity and the clarity, I intend to limit my discussion to the financial expert and the vendor of sweets. When Margayal's orderly life as a financial expert under the banyan tree is disrupted, he's des he, he desperately seeks an alternative. To fill his time, earn a livelihood. He encounters the old temple priest whose unheard ways give him the impression that the priest lives in a sort of timelessness, something which is beyond the clockwork time. The esoteric ritual suggested by the priest to appropriate goddess Lakshmi involves Margayas obtaining a bit of an antelope skin, a red lotus he made with milk from a smoke-colored cow and uttering a sacred verse 1,008 times for 40 days. This recitation takes eight hours each day chronology. The combination of measured quantities, that is 1,008 times, eight hours and 40 days, transports him to a world of sacred timelessness. So from time to be moved to the timelessness. It results in this emerging trimmer, healthier, and a younger in experience. The priest, it should be added, is no longer at the temple when Margaya tries to consult him. He had set out on a pilgrimage of uncertain duration. Again, something which is beyond the clock time of present. A momentary guy who has vanished into time. Again, when Margaya becomes famous as the wizard and the cash he handles overflows the boxes and the rooms of his house, the description takes the story to the realm of fantastic. In page 161 to 164, it begins at a definite point in time, that is, a present. It was in the third year of the war. So that is a definitive quantified pointings of a time. And Margaya's dizziness, success in a short while, makes money making his sole preoccupation and routine, so that he has no time or inclination for food or rest. Engaged in counting money, garnering money, calculating interest on principle over specific periods of time, he has paradoxically no time for himself. So he spends so much time in actually building up the money that he actually has no time for himself. So the time for himself and time for counting money is being separated <coughs> by Nara. <coughs> Engaged in counting money and garnering money and calculating the interest is something which is belongs to the time of uh, chronology and the personal time, which is the phenomenological uh, present of aporia. The aporia of present is generated when he is unable to find time for himself. An obvious fantastic in the sense of unreal out of this world is uh, suggested when I say, I must have a strong room built somewhere. I wish I could find time to attend. So he needs that time as well. The notice of Balu's death and the urgings of relatives and the friends force Margaya to disrupt his routine and make him reluctantly a trip to Madras, present Chennai. The feeling of the waste of time away from his routine upsets him greatly. So you have a time which is uh, present, time which is past and time which is future. Other than, uh, other than that, in the phenomenology of time, we have the time wasted, time used and time not used. <coughs> so uh, he says, uh, it's three days since I went to my office. God knows what is happening to my business. Probably this is the beginning of the end. Margaya had felt irritated by his wife's brooding over Balu's running away from home. He too loved his son, but his money-making activity left him practically no time. 
to brood over Bali. So he has so much uh, given to money making, uh, the time he spends so much to money making that he doesn't have any time for his son, though he loves his son. On the other hand, in the vendor of sweets, the story progresses in a sequential manner, dealing with the communication gap between Jagan and his son, Mali, and in the description of Jagan's rigid routine. After Mali's return from America with grace, the gap widens to an abyss, mainly because of Mali's rudeness towards his father. Jagan finds it difficult to maintain his routine rigorously. On two occasions, Mali's offenses cause major disruption in Jagan's routine of day. And on both occasions, the double scheme of time comes into operation. The first disruption is caused by Mali's insult to, to Jagan's professional pride. He has better plans, he informs his father, than to become a vendor of sweet meats. Jagan reacts by reducing the price of his wares so drastically that it leaves everyone puzzled and causes consternation among the other confectionaries in the town. Jagan's disordered state of mind, on which his cousin comments in page 99, is soothed by the expedition to the image maker's neglected workshop in the chapter 8. This workshop is located beside the dilapidated temple on the opposite bank of the river beyond Nalappa's grove. The image maker searches in water for the stone his master and left for seasoning in order to fashion a statue of Gayatri, the goddess of radiance, who, whose attributes he chants loudly in Sanskrit uh, song, Mukta Vidruma Hema. Jagan's experience a sense Jagan experiences a sense of being transported beyond the limitations of space and time. When he says, quote, and I quote, watching him in this setting, it was difficult for Jagan, as he mutely followed him, to believe that he was in the 20th century, sweetly handing money, and his son's problems seemed remotely and unrelated to him. The edge of reality itself was beginning to blur. This man from previous millennium seemed to be the only object worth notice. He looked like one possessed. And I can The second major disruption occurs when Jagan is horrified to learn that Mali is not formally married to Grace and refused to become so. Instead, he plans to pack her off to a cypriotic. Jagan tries to carry on with his routine at the shop by functions with only a part of himself. In the evening, while sitting on the pedestal of a lowly statue, he falls into a long reverie in pay, from page 153 to one, uh, 180, you can see that, uh, about happy days of his youth and marriage and much awaited birth of Mali, who was born as a result of pilgrimage to Sarpitin. So we are transported from the present into the memory. So the memory becomes a, a kind of a time object for him. He is surprised to awaken to the clamor of bird at dawn, having dozed off while he was brooding on the past. His future course of action, however, becomes clear to him. He will renounce his present life for tranquility of the image maker's victory. When his disturbed home life reaches a point of crisis, threatening him with a nervous breakdown, the solution dawns on him through an interesting interaction of the past, present, future continuum. Jagan's reverie about his crowded happy home during the years gone by takes his mind off his unhappy lonely present. So, you know, uh, sometimes memory is used as a, a modus spiritualis to supplement the present problems. So sometimes uh, uh, we like to think about not present as a present, but as the aporia, as a doubt of the present that steeps into us when we are blending into the future as a present and past as a present. So how, we, how does past becomes our present? Not only by the object of, uh, that is, for instance, photographs or uh, things uh, of the childhood that uh, uh, comes across and you start remembering your childhood. That is not only way when time functions through memory, but time functions through memory when uh, we see that the present, everything which is present is not actually in the presence, but the absence of the presence is actually the present. That is, I am not you know, eight years old, and that makes me feel that yes, I was eight years old. So the temptation of tranquility offered by the retreat beyond Nalappa grows, uh, Nalappa grow, grows stronger. He can enter into a sense of timelessness while he watches the image maker at work, and he can also be involved in the continuation of a great artistic tradition. And uh, this, in this way, we see uh, Narayan has uh, been a very strategic in his use of uh, time and timeless. So, uh, 
At times, both of them together functions as a narrative parallels. And at times, they are separated either through memory or through the action of past, present and future. Thank you. <coughs> hello, hello. Yes, it's functioning. Uh, when we, before uh, we move on to our next event, I would like to mention that uh, uh, Professor Onisha Sengupta, um, our dear colleague, she was supposed to remain present and in today's program and she was supposed to present a paper as well but uh, because of a sudden illness she's not well so that's the reason she couldn't attend the program and we miss her badly and wish that uh, and I very well know that she will be present in the next program or event that uh, we will be presenting or organizing uh, later. Uh, uh, kono, koli kichu bolen, days to onekeri onek kichu, uh, uh, bhavna chinta bolen, ma, kichu bolben, kichu days to প্রত্যেক বাড়ি ইংরেজি বিভাগ আমাকে পড়ার জন্য সাদরে আমন্ত্রণ করে আমি এই বিভাগ থেকে অনেক দূরের মানুষ তো তোমাদের অনেক অনেক আমার পক্ষ থেকে ধন্যবাদ এবং শুভেচ্ছা আসলে মানুষ তো বেঁচে থাকে প্রত্যেকটা মুহূর্তকে নিয়েই আমার নিজের মনে হয় এই যে মুহূর্তগুলো সারা দিন ধরে আমাদের এগিয়ে চলে সেই মুহূর্তগুলোই তো জুড়ে 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 একটা দিন তৈরি হয় আবার অনেকগুলো দিন মানে বহু মুহূর্তের সমষ্টি একটা জীবন একটা মহাজীবনকে তৈরি করে একটা দিন মানেই কিন্তু অনেকগুলো মুহূর্তের সমাহার বা সমষ্টি যেখানে নানান উজ্জ্বল বা অনুজ্জ্বল ঘটনা মধ্যে আমরা নায়ক বা প্রতিনায়ক হয়ে থেকে যাই আমরা সেই ঘটনাগুলো প্রধান চরিত্র হয়ে থেকে যাই ওই মুহূর্তগুলোই ঘটে যাওয়া ঘটনাগুলো এবং সেই ঘটনাগুলোকে থেকে 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 থেকেই তৈরি হয়ে যায় মালগুড়ি দেশের মতন একটা কাহিনী যে কাহিনীতে কোথায় অজান্তেই আমরাই নায়ক হয়ে যাই আমরা তো কোন জমিদার সামন্ত প্রভু সম্রাট অধিশ্বর নই আমরা যারা একেবারেই ব্রাত্য একেবারেই মন্ত্রহীন আমরা নায়ক হয়ে যাই ওই মালগুডি দেজের মধ্যে এই মুহূর্তগুলো ছোট্ট ছোট্ট আমাদের স্নেহ আবেগ দয়া হিংসা ঈর্ষা কলহ প্রতিহিংসা এবং অবশেষে এই সমস্ত কিছুর শেষে এক আশ্চর্য এক আনন্দে স্পর্শে প্রেলবতা স্পর্শে সমস্ত ক্ষত মুছে যায় সেই কথাই কিন্তু বলে যাচ্ছেন প্রত্যেকটা গল্পের মধ্যে দিয়ে সিরিয়ালে দেখা আমার ছিয়াশি সাল থেকে আমার ছোটবেলার মালগুডি ডেস এক অদ্ভুত গল্প আমার মনে হয় ভারতীয় সাহিত্যে আছে কি না আমি জানি না বাংলা সাহিত্যে তো নেই আমি বাংলাটা একটু আধটু যেটুকু পড়েছি একটা কাল্পনিক একটা স্থান একটা কাল্পনিক স্থান মালগুডি বলে কোনো জায়গা নেই সেটা এরকম বিশ্ববিখ্যাত এবং জ্যান্তর থেকে আরো বেশি জ্যান্ত জীবিত অধিক জীবিত হয়ে যাচ্ছে কোনো স্থান একজন লেখকের স্পর্শে লেখক তাকে করে দিচ্ছে নমর এরকম বাংলা সাহিত্যে নেই আমি অনেক কিছু স্মরণ রেখেও বলছি কিন্তু আমার গঙ্গা আছে আমার বীরভূম আছে আমার হাসুলি বাগ আছে কিন্তু একটা অঞ্চল সারা পৃথিবী ব্যাপী বিখ্যাত এবং আমিও জানতাম বহু মানুষ জানেন আমারই মতন মালগুটি সত্যি একটা জায়গা 
একটা স্থান জীবিত জ্যান্ত হয়ে উঠছে সত্যিই কিন্তু ইংল্যান্ডে বেকার স্ট্রিট আছে আমার প্রশ্নটা অন্য জায়গায় আমি যে জায়গাটা ধরতে চাইছি নেই কিন্তু আছে নেই কিন্তু আছে কে করে দেওয়া এতখানি জীবন্ত ভাবে তৈরি করে দেওয়া আর কে লক্ষ্মণ এবং আর কে নারায়ণ মিলে করে দিলেন স্মরণীয় শুধু নয় অবিস্মরণীয় করে দিলেন বেকার স্ট্রিট আছে কিন্তু ইংল্যান্ডে সত্যি আছে হাসুলিবাগ সত্যি আছে এত বিখ্যাত নয় বীরভূম আছে আবার বলছি গঙ্গা আছে তিতাস আছে ভলগা আছে পদ্মা আছে পদ্মা নদী আছে কিন্তু নেই অথচ আছে অবিস্মরণীয় সেখানে কারা আছে সেখানে আমরা আছি আমাদের ওই মুহূর্ত কথাগুলো আছে আমাদের ওই কথা ওই ছোট্ট ছেলেটা তার কত গল্প আমার ঠিক এখন স্পষ্ট মনে নেই তাদের মারামারি আবেগ হিংসা এবং শেষকালে ওই চূড়ান্ত বন্ধুদের সঙ্গে ঝগড়া মারামারির পরে একসঙ্গে বসে টক তুলে আচার খাওয়া কিংবা আলু কাবলি খাওয়া কিংবা একটা ক্রিম বিস্কিট আমাদের সময় তো এত চকলেট পিজ্জা চিকেনের বাহার ছিল না ক্রিম বিস্কিট এর অত্যন্ত লোভনীয় একটা পদার্থ বস্তু ছিল অরেঞ্জ ক্রিম বিস্কিট সেইটা খাওয়া যতদূর মনে করছে আমি ঠিক বলছি কি না মনে না সেই ভাগ করে খাচ্ছি মালগুটি ডেজেরই গল্প অবিস্মরণীয় এবং সেইখানে কখন আমরা এই ছোট ছোট মানুষরা যারা আমরা ব্রাপ্ত আমরা একেবারেই মন্ত্রহীন পূজারি আমাদের ঢুকতে দেয় না মন্দিরের মধ্যে মসজিদের মধ্যে গির্জার মধ্যে আমরা নায়ক হয়ে যাই সারা পৃথিবী আমাদের দেখে তোমাদের আমাদের সকলকে দেখে বারে বারে দেখে মুগ্ধ হয় পরে শোনে এবং শুধু তাই না স্মৃতিতে স্মৃতিতে মনে মনে বংশ পরম্পরায় ঠাকুর দাদা বাবা আমরা আমাদের সন্তানরা প্রবাহিত হয়ে যায় মালগুটির মধ্যে দিয়ে আমরা মেচে 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 থাকি রবীন্দ্রনাথের একটা গান আছে আমার বসে বসে মনে হচ্ছিল গীতাঞ্জলি পরমেরি গান অন্ত নাই গো নাই সেই আনন্দ আমার আমার অনুপরমাণুর মধ্যে সেই আনন্দ উচ্চে উঠছে সেই অনুপরমাণুগুলো তো ওই ঘটনার অনুপরমাণু যেগুলোর মধ্যে আনন্দ উজ্জ্বল হয়ে উছলে পড়ছে এবং সেই মাটির প্রদীপগুলো আলো হয়ে জ্বালিয়ে রেখেছে মালগুলিকে সারা পৃথিবী পাঠকদের কাছে দর্শকদের কাছে শ্রোতাদের কাছে আর আমরা আমাদের অজান্তে নায়ক হয়ে উঠছি ধন্যবাদ ধন্যবাদ সুরজিত দা আপনি যখনই কিছু বলেন আমরা খুব সমৃদ্ধ হই অনুষ্ঠানে একটা অন্য আঙ্গিক রচিত হয় আমরা পরের যে অনুষ্ঠান যে প্রোগ্রাম প্রোগ্রাম না মানে যেটা দেখাবো আমরা এরপর সেটার আগে বলছি যে যারা পার্টিসিপেট করেছিলে কম্পিটিশানে কারা কারা প্রেজেন্ট আছো একটু হাতটা তোলো প্লিজ রেজ ইউর হ্যান্ড আচ্ছা তোমরা আমরা এরপরে যে সিনেমাটা দেখাবো সিনেমাটা হয়ে যাওয়ার পর কনফারেন্স রুমে তোমরা যারা যারা প্রেজেন্ট আছো কনফারেন্স রুমে যাবে আমাদের সাথে একটু দেখাবো আর একটা হচ্ছে আমরা একটা ফিডব্যাক ফর্ম সার্কুলেট করছি প্রত্যেকে যারা যারা প্রেজেন্ট আছো সেখানে সাইন করবে এবং কন্ট্যাক্ট নাম্বার যা যা আছে প্রত্যেকে পিছনে যারা বসে আছো ফর্মটা কিন্তু ফিল আপ করে তারপরে তোমরা অডিটোরিয়ামটা ছেড়ে যেও দেবজ্যোতি Thank you students and thank you teachers and physics. Uh, we will be uh, screening the movie The Hero, episode 43 of Malgudi Days.